Hey class, this is Mrs. Ulrich, and today we're talking about solids. So, solids can be described in terms of crystal structure, density, and elasticity. We're going to talk about what those mean. Um, crystal structure is the shape of a crystal mirrors the geometric arrangement of atoms within the crystal. So the arrangement of the atoms, how they're arranged within um, your molecule, the crystal shape will mirror that. So as you enlarge it, it'll have a structure that's similar to how the atoms are arranged. For example, quartz or mica, fool's gold, um, they have smooth flat surfaces at angles to one another. That's kind of what a crystal is. So the minerals are made of crystals. They have those regular geometric patterns and their components are arranged in an orderly repeating pattern. So that pattern repeats over and over and over again. So those are crystals. Um, the minerals themselves may not be perfectly structured, like you could take several crystal units and stick them together, um, but they will still have that crystal structure. Some minerals you can see with your eye, so you could look at um, you know, the cut of some stone or something like that, and you kind of see the shape in the minerals. Some of them, though, you need an x-ray. So this is an x-ray of a salt molecule. Um, and so it can show you all the different uh, particles in there, and it's actually showing us the structure of the sodium and the chloride atoms within a salt um, crystal. So they uh, take an x-ray of this, and just like you take an x-ray of your bones, it shows you the pattern of those atoms. And all crystals of sodium chloride produce the same design. So it doesn't change no matter what it is because they have the same crystal structure. So here's the crystal structure, right? You have your sodium and your chlorine ions, um, and then you put them together and you get that x-ray pattern. So that's where that comes from. So those patterns made by x-rays um, show us that it's there's an orderly arrangement of those atoms, and every crystalline structure, every different kind of structure, has its own pattern. So the pattern is different with each, with each different kind of crystal. So what determines the shape of a crystal? The arrangement of the atoms in a crystal. All right, density. So the first one was crystal structure, and now we'll talk about density. I like to say density is the amount of stuff in a certain amount of space, right? So here's your book definition, though. The density depends upon the masses of the individual atoms that make it up and the spacing between those atoms. So if you have really heavy atoms, that are really close together, it's going to be a really dense material. But if you have really heavy atoms that are super far apart, it may not be quite as dense. So how tightly the material is packed together, right? You take something and you squish it, it now has a higher density. It's the amount of mass per volume. So it's the amount of stuff, mass, and a certain amount of space. We're not talking weight per volume, because weight is a force. We're talking mass, which is in kilograms. For example, take a loaf of bread, some nice white Wonder Bread. You take that loaf of bread, it's super light and airy, right? It takes up a fair amount of space. Now you take that and you squish it down as small as you can make it. The squished bread has a higher density than the original loaf of bread. And the volume changes. Note, the mass does not change. I still have the same amount of bread. It is just more dense now. So, speaking of that, density is a property of the material. doesn't matter how much you have. So, let's say we have an iron nail. It's got the same density as an iron pan. Even if the pan has 100 times as many atoms and 100 times as much mass, it'll take up 100 times as much space. So, 100 times my mass divided by 100 times my volume, the hundreds will cancel out and I'll have the same density. So the mass per unit volume is the same. Density does vary a little bit with temperature and pressure. So say you take something up to a really high altitude, it's going to have a slightly different density, um, even though you haven't really changed the properties of it. And um, But generally speaking, we give densities at zero degrees Celsius and atmospheric pressure, which later we'll talk about some things. It's like, oh, it's one atmosphere or different units. But just know that that's our baseline for densities. 
water is um, special, we use water's density at 4 degrees Celsius because it has a nice round number of 1 gram per centimeter cubed. So that's the density we use for water. Otherwise, it's at zero and atmospheric pressure. All right, we also use something called weight density. So we just have normal density, which is mass per volume, and now we have weight density, which is the weight per volume. So they use it often in discussing liquid pressure. So you could say pounds per cubic foot. Um, and so you can understand the pressure on someone. So remember, pressure is force over area. So weight is a force, but we're giving a force over a volume instead of a force over an area. So we'll use that for liquid pressure, but we won't use it a whole lot. Just something to know. All right, so here's your problem. Which has a greater density? one kilogram of water or ten kilograms of water? How about five kilograms of lead or ten kilograms of aluminum? Water is going to have the same density. It doesn't matter how much water you have, it'll have the same. So the one kilogram or ten kilograms of water, same density. Whereas lead and aluminum, who cares that I have five kilograms of lead and ten kilograms of aluminum, the density stays the same um, because of the property of lead and aluminum. And lead is more dense than aluminum. So what determines the density of a material? The amount of mass in a certain space. Or really, it's how massive are your atoms and how spaced apart are they. All right, finally, elasticity. Elasticity, so hopefully we'll do our gummy worm lab and we'll talk about elasticity, right? So we talked about elastic collisions. So for this, it's how much it changes shape when a deforming force acts on it and how well it returns to its original shape when the deforming force is removed, right? So that's what elastic is. You take an elastic band and you stretch it and it goes back into place. And now if you stretch it really far, maybe it won't go quite perfectly back in place. So that's not perfectly elastic. So how well it gets back to its original shape when you take away that stretching force. So you take a spring, hang a weight on it, it'll stretch, right? Hang some more weights, it'll stretch some more. Hang enough weights, and it may not spring back to its original length. But if you only hang some weight, once you take the weight off, it'll spring right back to the way it was before. And a material that returns to that original shape is elastic, right? Just like an elastic collision, things hit each other and then bounce off. That's elastic. And inelastic is when it doesn't do that. So here's some examples. When a bat hits a baseball, if you see a, a high-speed camera of a bat hitting a, hitting a baseball or a golf club hitting a golf ball, you see um, a small change in the shape. It gets squished for a moment and then it springs back. And so that's elastic. Or like archery, an archer bends um, the bow, right? So you can see here, um, the bow is bent and he's pulling on the string, so he's adding this force. When he lets go of this arrow and lets it fly, the bow's gonna return back to its original position, which is probably out here somewhere, right? So it'll spring back to that. Those are elastic objects. Obviously, though, not everything is elastic. I, you know, you take your iPhone 6 and you bend it, it's not going to return to its original position. It would be inelastic. There's also things like clay, putty, or dough, right? You take some silly putty, bend it, it's not going to bounce back. And you take some Play-Doh, bend it, it's not going to bounce back. Um, they don't assume, they don't resume their original shape. <laughs> All right, so there's elastic and inelastic, and now there's something called Hooke's Law, which talks about the amount of stretch and the applied force and the relationship between those. So you hang a weight. Okay, we hang one, one weight. We get maybe a tiny bit of stretch. Okay, we hang two weights. Okay, two weights, we get a little more stretch. Three weights, we get some more stretch. Four, more, five, more, right? So it increases directly, to directly proportional, add more force, you get more distance of stretch, right? That's what delta x means, it's a change in the distance. So, double the force, double the stretch. Um, triple the force, triple the stretch. 
so on and so forth. So triple this, this is three times this stretch. And this is four times this stretch. This picture is maybe not the best thing for it, but that is that is what it is. So it's a direct relationship between the amount of force and the amount of stretch. Double force, double stretch. Triple force, triple stretch. Quadruple force, quadruple stretch. All right, if you stretch something and it won't return to its original state, that is where we call the elastic limit. Right, so let's say you do pick up your iPhone 6 and you bend it just a teensy tiny bit and it goes right back to where it's at. Fabulous. You have not reached the elastic limit. It is an elastic device to that point. Now, let's say you really take your iPhone 6 and you start bending, 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 and all of a sudden you let go and now it's got a new shape. You have gone beyond its elastic limit. It is now inelastic and you now have a bent iPhone 6, which is worth a lot less than a non-bent iPhone 6. Right, so Hooke's Law, the direction, uh, double the force, double the stretch, that only is true as long as you don't go past the elastic limit. So once you pass the elastic limit, it's a completely different ballgame. Alright, so think. You've got a tree branch. It obeys Hooke's Law. Double the force, double the stretch. So, you hang a 20 kilogram load, right? 20 kilograms is a mass, not a weight. To have a weight, I would multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity because force equals mass times acceleration. So 20 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared would give me 200 newtons of force. Perfect. But that doesn't matter because I can still do this problem without that. I just want you to know that. Okay, 20 kilogram load, it sags 10 centimeters. What if I hang a 40 kilogram load? I have doubled my mass, which will double my weight, which means double the force. So if I double the force, I double the stretch, right? So 10 centimeters is going to turn into 20 centimeters, right? And well, now it's 60 kilograms, that's three times, so it'll be three times the stretch. It'll be 30 centimeters. And then it says, assume none of these loads make it sag beyond its elastic limit. So it'll bounce back into place afterwards. All right, here's another one. If a force of 10 newtons stretches a spring 4 centimeters, so 10 newtons, it goes 4 centimeters. How much stretch do we get if we apply a 15 newton force? All right, how much have I multiplied my force by? Not 2, I've multiplied it by 1 and a half, right? So, if I multiply my force by one and a half, I'm going to multiply my stretch by one and a half. So I'll get four times 1.5 is six. Or you can do a ratio, right? So 10 newtons for four centimeters equals 15 newtons over x. Solve for x. You cross multiply, so you get, well, they did something else. You cross multiply, cross multiply, divide both sides by 10, and you get six. Okay? So, what characteristics are described by an object's elasticity? Its ability to return to its original shape after it's been bent. Right? So, that is our big stuff there. So, solids can be described by their crystal structure, their density, and their elasticity. That's all for this one.